All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Something is happening that should never be. Something insidious and real that's tearing us apart. What's at stake, what we stand to lose, is the heritage and future of our Anglican Church. All that we treasure in our congregation, our families, our children. Yet, before us is an historic choice that can change everything. twilight when this life on earth is through will they say that we were faithful will they say that we were true to the power of the faith that we Hello, I'm Grant Goodeve. Have you ever marveled at a priceless masterpiece? But suppose it wasn't the real thing. What if it were a forgery? On the surface, it looks good. Isn't that okay? You might even think, what difference does it make? But it makes all the difference in the world, especially when you consider, what if the masterpiece was switched and replaced by an imitation and nobody told you? That's the issue before us as a church. The church has been hijacked. I am heartbroken, quite frankly, at what is going on. This is more than a discussion about uh, theological uh, points between people in purple shirts and funny collars. The divisions are very uh, clear and loud. The reality is there's a different gospel that smuggled its way into the church in the West that's competing for our attention. And the leadership uh, have embraced a, a foreign, an alien, a pagan religion, uh, but they haven't told the people in the pew. At General Convention 2003, our masterpiece, God's Holy Scripture, was deliberately altered when a small group of Episcopal leaders rejected 2,000 years of Orthodox Christian tradition, teaching, and biblical authority. Suddenly, 77 million Anglicans worldwide were shown a counterfeit and told it was the real thing. Some realized it, some did not. In 2003, we voted to go insane. General Convention, alas, in 2003, opted for revisionism, namely the desire to reject the Christian faith and to embrace a non-Christian religion. I mean, it was an irrevocable decision to turn back against the teaching of the church, the teaching of the Bible, and the cries of Anglicans throughout the world and our ecumenical partners and people in other religions. Uh, Muslims, Jews, they were very concerned about what was being done. The forgery that's being presented to us as the faith today declares Jesus to be a way and not the way, the truth, and the life is declared in John 14, 6. What's going on in the Episcopal Church right now is part of this terrible rebellion. Uh, we believe that 2,000 years of church teaching, um, because it doesn't suit our, in fact, sexual appetites, um, our general appetites, we, we think, well, we can remake it in our own image. The abandonment of Orthodox Anglican beliefs at General Convention by a few Episcopal leaders was so severe that 22 provincial leaders in the Anglican Communion who were not consulted and yet who represent the vast majority of all Anglicans have either broken or declared impaired communion with the American province of the church. Meanwhile, 
lay people across America began to wake up and speak up. I don't know how the church is allowed to move and make decisions not following the canons, the articles. I, I don't understand that. And what has happened then, it's just has been a, a rush of man and his views. And man and his views, unfortunately, I think have been louder than God's views. I have asked myself this question, what is Jesus thinking of what we're doing? And uh, I'm sure he is greatly troubled. The Episcopal leaders at General Convention no longer viewed Holy Scripture as the trusted, authoritative Word of God. The leadership of the Episcopal Church in voting to confirm the election of Bishop Robinson consciously, deliberately repudiated scripture and tradition and embraced a pagan religion. The reality is there's a different gospel that smuggled its way into the church in the West that's competing for our attention, which de-emphasizes sin, it nearly ignores the cross and offers a Jesus that just kind of affirms and includes people. It does not accomplish the radical work of change and forgiveness and joy and peace that the real gospel represents. Today, we're faced, once again, with a very powerful, very seductive pagan culture that threatens to swallow up the Christian faith. And it's so easy to use the old words like God and Christ and Revelation and Scripture and mean something entirely different by them. And that's what makes for the crisis today, that the leaders of the Episcopal Church are using all the old words, but without telling the lay people, they have filled them with entirely different meaning. If the Bible changed just like everything else did, then the Bible would turn into the next Seventeen magazine and would change just like the fashions do. The counterfeit sounds like God loves us, God loves you, God loves me, but there's no transformation that's offered. There's no transportation out of the warfare and the mess of this world into God's kingdom established. Are we going to be trying to spend money that has no currency? Or are we going to have the real thing? The blatant denial of scriptural authority at General Convention was only a byproduct of a deeper, ongoing problem. Not quite 40 years ago, the Episcopal Church was unsuccessful in disciplining Bishop James Pike of California in 1966 when he denied the doctrine of the Trinity. He denied the very heart of our faith, the very definition of God, and the church's failure to discipline Bishop Pike at that time left the door wide open for the Christian faith to be eroded in the seminaries in the decades that followed. There is absolute truth that there is right and there is wrong, that there is God's word and that there is the father of lies. They need to know the truth because when they know the truth, they'll also know the falsehoods when they hear them. And without knowing what the truth is, you'll never know what the falsehoods are. This is a battle for the soul of the Western church and it's a battle for the shape of Christianity in the whole world at the beginning of the 21st century. That's not a minor thing. <laughs> The hope and future of our church is unfolding right before our eyes because a growing number of lay people are taking a stand and making a difference. Lay people in the Episcopal Church have an opportunity today to make history. I think the lay are the key to the future of the church, not just in North America but the world, and they're certainly the key in this battle for Anglicans. Dana Pope, a lay person in Dallas, Texas, is making a difference, one phone call one conversation at a time. I am a person who doesn't know a lot of things, who is not a theologian, I'm not an expert on scripture or anything, but I could tell something was wrong. After general convention, I met Kendall Harmon, and I asked him, what is it the lay people can do? I looked at her, and I started making suggestions like, uh, get together as a vestry and, and articulate your sense of the problem and share it with the congregation. 
start to organize and share with other vestries that are near you why you think that this is a big deal and start to build a network of, of lay people that you can communicate with in other communities around the diocese and actually build a base of communication and activism. I thought, well, I can do that. There were other faithful people within the Diocese of Dallas who wanted to support each other, pray for each other, and we have. There are certain things that bishops and priests cannot do. A bishop cannot very effectively go into another diocese. As a rector, I can't go into someone else's parish. But Dana can. Lay people can. Dana can communicate with others. She can seek others out, talk to them, share information. There are rectors who want to avoid the conflict. And so they keep their parishioners from finding, the, finding out what's going on. Uh, not that the parishioners couldn't find it out if they wanted to, but they just never talk about it. And Dana can talk to those people, and she can say, well, what you didn't hear was this, this, and this. People don't do anything if they're not informed. People are down on what they're not up on. And so what we have to do is give them information. Give them information about what's the truth, give them information about what's happening in the Episcopal Church. We need to point out to other members of the congregation, other lady, that wake up, it's time to see which way the train is going. What happens out of all this is that we touch people's heart, we expand God's kingdom, and the perk that we don't even think about is that we get a deeper, richer relationship with God ourselves. It's worth the fight. Lewis and Deborah Ropp are making a difference in their parish, even at the price of personal sacrifice. I think that Episcopalians today have to choose between following current culture or follow scripture. I don't think that, um, that right now parishioners in our church or a lot of churches are getting the, the full story and what's going on within the, the national church and what the objectives are. My prayer was really that this would just all go away and we could continue life as it always had been. When you get involved with people and start talking to them, you realize there's a lot of people out there that are just looking for someone to, to stand up and say what they believe to give them an opportunity to say, well, you know what, that's what I believe too, and I think that what we're doing within the church is, is wrong. It's been very painful to see the level of animosity and, and uh, division that is created when you just stand up and say, here's what I believe. We've had so many friends leave our church, and when they leave, they're leaving for good. And as easy as this is to ignore, at some times, it's also something that I don't think we can ignore. Still another layperson, Greg Griffith, is making a difference by using his high-tech talents to create interactive websites that are helping concerned church members see that they're not alone, that each person has a voice and a part to play. Lay people everywhere are choosing to remain faithful to historic Anglicanism. A layperson from Georgia is showing how one person's story can encourage thousands. This project started out as really just something for some, some friends of mine and, and men that I had met who I felt like weren't getting the truth. More than anything, what I wanted to communicate with this booklet was what it really means to be a Christian. We are to speak up. It is our, our obligation and our duty to speak up and defend Scripture. The power of a life that is an icon of God's truth is a power that can transform a congregation, it can transform a denomination, it can transform a nation. This is a day of choice. At a pivotal moment in history, Joshua appealed to the children of Israel, choose this day whom you will serve. With so much at stake before us, will we take these words to heart? The choice facing the laity in the Episcopal Church is to choose between authentic Christianity and this alien religion, which has permeated the leadership of the Episcopal Church in the last generation. Considering the culture that we live in and all of the attacks on the Christian faith, the attacks that come from Hollywood and the news media, politicians, and even other members of our own church, wouldn't it just be easier to keep our heads down? 
maybe to go quietly into the night. My prayer right now is, is for repentance across this country, uh, and certainly amongst the leadership of the Episcopal Church. Right now, our historic choices are coming upon us. In the very first generation of the church, Polycarp, the disciple of John the Apostle, at the end of his life, when he was 86 years old, in an amphitheater in Smyrna in 156 AD, said this, I have served my Lord these 86 years. I will not deny him now. In 1886, in Uganda, 32 young men serving in the court of King Mwanga refused his sexual advances and chose death over violating their values and went to death singing hymns to the glory of God that gave birth to the great revival in Uganda. These are just examples of men, women, and young adults making historic choices at their moment in history. If we want an Anglican church that is orthodox and biblical for our children and our grandchildren, now is the time for us to sacrifice the comfort of avoiding problems. The question, or the choice before us is, will we serve God, or will we serve the spirit of this age? If we choose to serve the spirit of this age, then we are going to choose to be orphans who create other orphans. If we choose to serve God and we bring others into a relationship with God, then we're bringing them into a family that lasts forever. I think this is an incredible opportunity, we as an Anglican body, we as a Christian body, to stop and take stock of where we are at in our walk with Christ. Are we still trying to fulfill the Great Commission? Are we still educating our people in the ways of the Lord and are we on our knees, are we repenting and are we seeking God in all those things? Joshua would say, choose life, choose the Lord, choose this day. It matters whether you choose today. You can make all the difference in the world if you choose today. And the question is, what did you do in that moment? And what if we have nothing to say? What if we did not answer that question in this call at this time? What if we gather with those great saints in glory and what we have to say is nothing? How terrible will that be? Paul says it this way. He says that he who has called you is faithful and he will do it. So do you believe that? I do. It's time to make a choice. Will you hold on to the authority of scripture? or allow God's holy word to be dismantled to fit the trends of our time? Will you find ways to invent new sacraments? Or will you uphold true apostolic teachings? Will you trust your future to a drifting alien religion? Or will you remain faithful to the one true Lord? The choice is yours. Will you choose the day? this day will you choose this day choose this day whom you will serve tell me who will you serve as for me and my house we will serve the Lord choose this day whom you will serve <laughs>